Our panel this morning is, is going to be moderated by David Bragdon. Um, he's the director of uh, Transit Center. And um, David has a, a great history. He's done a lot of different things in the realm of transportation. Um, he's bi-coastal. Uh, he's worked on everything from freight uh, to cities to transit uh, to metropolitan planning. Um, and he's uh, done a lot of work in, um, in uh, Portland, Oregon, and the metropolitan area there, as well as New York City. And now over at Transit Center, we've been working with um, them for the last couple of years on this project that you may have seen, the Transit Street Design Guide. I hope everyone's seen it and has a copy. Um, and we're really excited that it's been bringing that project itself, as well as the rollout, is bringing cities and transit agencies together. And so the panel that we're going to have this morning um, is going to feature the uh, transit agencies and the cities um, in both the case of Los Angeles um, and <laughs> sorry, um, and Seattle. And so we're really excited to have everybody here this morning. Um, I just wanted to say that I, I David is a great moderator. He's um, uh, he's no Lester Holt, I think, but I'm. <laughs> I am sure we're going to have a really great discussion today and hopefully much less contentious and more enlightening uh, than yesterday evening. Please welcome David Bragdon and the panel to the stage. Well, city governments and transit agencies on the same stage, right? You've got to come to the West Coast to see that. Uh, <laughs> At, at Transit Center, we're very interested in sparking change in, in how urban transportation is provided. And we think there are two main ways that are the gateway to doing that. One is finding the right people who, who want to do new stuff. And then secondly, changing the practices by which they do stuff and giving the ability to, to do things in a new way. That's why we like working with NACTO so much. That's why we've helped to fund the Transit Streets Design Guide. That's why we're funding workshops around the country about actually implementing it and bringing it together. So we're particularly interested in the institutional aspects of bringing city governments and transit agencies together, who all too often are not. Sometimes they cooperate, sometimes they're in conflict, sometimes, maybe this is the worst case, sometimes they're totally indifferent to each other. But like it or not, or know it or not, they're highly, highly interdependent. And understanding that interdependence is really important. Think about, most of you I know are city DOT people, but think for a moment about being a transit operator and trying to serve your customers. And the things that are most important to transit customers, as, as we've verified in some work we've done uh, in the past couple of years in terms of attitudes of what, what customers want. Well, city governments control the streets on which transit agencies run buses. That's the most important part of punctuality and, and reliability. Those are two, as, as well as, as, the, as the speed. The, the, the cities also regulate and sometimes sponsor other modes of transportation that can connect, whether it's regulating taxis or whether it's sponsoring bike share. The, those things are often in, in, in the hands of city government. City governments control the sidewalks, the access, the ability to get to bus stops or to transit stations. Once you get off the transit agency's property, it's really the responsibility of the city. And again, that's a major factor for, for transit usage is just the ability to get to the, the station. And finally, city governments zone the areas around the transit, what types of uses, and that is another one of the major determinants of whether there's going to be transportation, whether there's going to be people using transit. So from the standpoint of a transit operator, most of the factors that determine whether or not you're going to be successful are out of your control. Most of those factors of the surrounding land uses, the ability to get to the station, whether your vehicles are going to move fast or not, are totally out of control of the transit agency or in the hands of the city. That's why this relationship is so important to transit agencies. But it's a two-way street, actually, because just as transit agencies can't be successful without city's help, frankly, cities can't be successful without good transit. And increasingly, we have mayors, we have city councils, who business communities, who now recognize that. Now, if you want to have 71,000 jobs in the South Lake Union District, good luck doing that without transit. That won't happen. There will not be 71,000 jobs in South Lake Union. If those jobs even came to this region without transit, they'd be scattered all over the foothills of the Cascades or gobbling up the farmland in the, in the Kent Valley. Good luck meeting your greenhouse gas emissions or just clean air 
federal air conformity without transit. If you're Denver, if you're Salt Lake City, you can't get there without it. Good luck having social mobility and connecting people to jobs and education. Again, one of the most important determinants of whether a society is successful, whether people have economic mobility, is whether they have physical mobility. So good luck getting people to work or to school without good transit. So for a city to be successful, you've got to have a successful transit agency. Well, we're lucky we have two exemplars here in terms of regions that really do get that. And they're working together through personal relationships, institutional relationships, and policies, and mutual understanding. Now, let me tell you, as coming from New York City, where I currently live, where the governor who controls the MTA and the mayor who controls the streets don't get along particularly well, we might say. And where the fact is we've got some of the top talented people of city DOTs from the whole country working you know, in New York City DOT, we've got some of the most talented people working at the, the MTA in trans. I mean, they're moving Herculean numbers of people every day, yet they're, they're locked in this situation like, you know, that they have, they're, they're in dysfunctional family because the two parents are sleeping in different bedrooms and throwing lamps and, and uh, plates at each other and, and won't agree. That's not the case here with the two cities that we're going to talk about. Both Seattle and Los Angeles are at a moment right now, independently, but just they both have a first-term mayor who came to office quite fairly recently. Neither of them necessarily campaigned on a big platform of transportation, but when they came into office, each of those mayors made it a big deal. And each of them then went out and recruited a really hot and ready-to-go transportation director who was ready to make change. Both those mayors did that. And then they've, they've also been very active in making the case to the voters. I see they're acting up here. The, now, at the same time, both of, these, both of these places also have new leadership at their transit agencies. That's actually more recent than the mayoral election. And it's not, necessarily, it's not related entirely to the mayoral election, though both those mayors took a big interest in it. So there's new leadership at both of those transit agencies. Both of them are proposing big capital expansion programs that they're going to go to the voters with in uh, less than two months now. Just for perspective, and I love hearing Polly give you New York figures to, be, to be, give you national perspective. Let me give you some, some of these perspectives. This November, uh, on the ballot, there's going to be $214 billion worth of requests from jurisdictions around the country for transit, $214 billion. 81% of that, 100, about $175 billion, is right here on this stage. So, so, so these are daring people. We've got the, the largest and then the second largest capital ask going in front of the voters. And because I'm the moderator, I'm not going to say who's number one or number two, because, I, because, because it depends if we're talking per capita or aggregate. So you can answer it either way. How's that for moderation? So why don't we start with the people from the, from the furthest away. Uh, and I guess I haven't introduced them, but you, they probably don't need an introduction. Salida Reynolds and Stephanie Wiggins, respectively, from Los Angeles DOT and LA Metro. And Peter Rogoff and uh, you talked yesterday. You're familiar, right? <laughs> from C <laughs> and Scott Kubley from Seattle D Sound Transit and, uh, and, and Seattle DOT. So, can, can we start with, with you, Salita and, and Stephanie? You, you come from probably the most auto-oriented, historically speaking, yet you also have this very ambitious change that you want to make in the, the legacy of the old RTOs. Tell me how you go about working on those things together, and can you give us some examples of how you get started when your ultimate goal is this $120 billion package? But there's stuff you're doing right now that I think would be interesting for you to share. I mean, I think that, um, so Metro and uh, the city of Los Angeles, including our, our public works bureaus, um, our planning departments, um, have not always had a highly functional relationship. Um, uh, and, and that's sort of putting it mildly. mildly. 
Um, but we are in the middle of one of the biggest, um, you know, infrastructure capital buildouts in the U.S., if not in North America, and at the same time, trying to uh, herd a bunch of cats to put together an effective ballot measure that reflects the desires of very um, auto-oriented parts of of the county and also um, very urban parts of the of the of the county in Los Angeles. Um, I think that for from my perspective, it really begins and ends with leadership and relationships. So um, Phil Washington, who came from Denver, really set a tone when he arrived that um, this was going to be about collaboration. And uh, Mayor Garcetti, when he was uh, chairing the, the, the Metro Board, also made it a uh, top line priority to con be a convener and bring people together. Um, but to see that trickle down to the staff level means that you have to spend time building relationships and repairing trust and also making sure that you always err on the side of communicating more when things get really difficult. And things get really difficult. You're talking about multi-million dollar projects and their schedules. Um, and when the city wants something like, you know, can you just, can you square up this corner after you rip open the street and tunnel underneath it and then put it back together, um, that actually may have implications that drive up the cost of a project and, and send it out months and months past its, its time. So those are little things that turn into big disagreements. And if you don't settle them professionally, then you're going to bring that baggage into the next tough thing that you talk about. Absolutely. Um, I think relationships are so critical and key. As the transit agency, um, we sometimes undervalue the relationship because we believe we, we come with funding. We provide what we call local return or funds back to the cities for sidewalk improvements, street repair, uh, signal synchronization. We provide discretionary uh, funding through calls for projects. And our expectation and is- we really appreciate that. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. You guys are just amazing. <laughs> And in doing so, our expectation is we can um, target those funds to help align with our agenda. Um, over 80% of our riders either walk or bicycle to our bus stops or transit stations. So it's really important that we have that alignment. And oftentimes, we can be focused on our agenda, which is delivering the multi-billion dollar projects, and forget about the city's needs. And so Salida and I have been in very difficult meetings. Um, where it does come down to relationships, communicating, and it does help, unlike um, what David said happens in New York, it helps that we know the mayor and our CEO, Phil Washington, as well as the rest of our board are, have the same vision. That helps us uh, focus on coordination, better coordination, because they're going to hold us accountable. And the real work happens outside the meeting. It happens That's in the true. hallway afterwards yeah. when... Stephanie and I say to each other, can you believe she yeah, said that? Oh, my yeah. God. We call it choir um, practice. Right. Happy hour is choir practice. Choir practice. Yes. 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 There's a, there is a little bit of overlap in, in governance in the sense that, that Salida, your boss, Mayor Garcetti, uh, was in his first year, I think, was chair of the Metro Board, so in effect was, was also Metro's boss, which, which happens on a cycle. Mm -hmm. I know you have 88 other cities in the, right. in the county, so it rotates. But... Does that aspect of, of having Mayor Garcetti and this priority that he gives to this issue and having him in a position where he has some authority over both, does, you know, how does that play? Certainly Mayor de Blasio would probably give his right arm to be able to, every three years, be chair of the MTA. How, how does, has that made a difference for you guys? I, I think it makes a huge difference. Um, one of the things that the mayor did um, when he put his, the other uh, representatives from Los Angeles on the board is typically they are electeds. Um, but he chose to uh, put somebody on the board who's not elected, a woman named Jackie DuPont Walker, um, who is, a, a, how does she describe herself, a faith-based developer um, in uh, South LA. And I, at that really sent a strong message about what the mayor expected uh, Metro's priorities and focus to be that um, I think Phil does an excellent job articulating that the, the transit agency sees itself in the business of building wealth in the communities that it passes through and that um, they're not doing transit-oriented development, they're creating transit-oriented districts and really trying to confront that challenge head-on, which is something that the mayor also brings 
um, to the city and, and has made a really um, high priority the focus around homelessness and equity and keeping our city affordable. And really, transportation as a means to that end um, is a strong value that runs through both uh, Metro and, and the city. And I don't know that that is, if he hadn't done those things, I don't know that, that we would necessarily be um, thinking about it in that way. But it's absolutely, you know, the main reason for uh, what we, we do what we do. Yeah. The mayor sets the tone. And through our CEO's leadership, um, we've really worked to kind of break down some silos that exist between the two agencies. And we have our principal summit breakfast that it's Phil really holds. Good, it's really good breakfast, by <laughs> yeah. the way. Yeah. burritos are on point. You have to bribe them any way you can. Mm -hmm. Funding and food. Free food. That's my recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, but really to get all of the city departments in one room uh, with our CEO and our senior management team to really talk frankly about the issues that are at hand really helps um, break down the silos of communication because we're a big bureaucracy. They're a bigger bureaucracy. Um, but uh, we have to do that. And having the mayor serve uh, on the Metro board and um, be the leader of such a large city is so critical because it really does um, create accountability at all levels. Mm -hmm. And that's why you've got attention at the highest level within Metro. You know, Scott, speaking of funding, because funding flows uh, in some senses, the other direction here, even before you were here, Seattle DOT was one of the first in the country to, to put together a transit plan. And there are people that said, well, why is the city government doing a transit plan in Seattle? The county, this was several years ago, really before Sound Transit really came into it. People said, well, the King County runs Metro. Why is the city doing a plan? And it's become more obvious why that actually makes sense, particularly you know, under your leadership, because then the city stepped up and is taxing itself to contribute to transit. So you're, in effect, the city government is buying transit service from the county, which is an unusual type of situation. You chose to, to do that uh, at a greater degree than the suburbs were willing to do. And then more recently, your voters did us another approval of a ballot measure where you expressly had metrics in there about improving streets specifically for transit. So can you, you talk a little bit about how Seattle DOT evolved from you know, recognizing the importance of transit to actually implementing it and then putting metrics to it and deciding it was worth buying more service from the agency? Absolutely. So before I jump into that, I want to just give a quick plug for those of you who did not read the Seattle Times, which is probably a lot. Uh, this morning, yesterday, our city council passed 9-0, our reduction in speed limits on arterials to 25 miles an hour. And non-arterials to 20 miles an hour. So it's really exciting. Jim Curtin, who I think is sitting over in that area somewhere with his hand not up, uh, really did amazing work kind of pushing that, uh, pushing that through. So I want to thank him. So how did we, how did we get here? I, you know, I, I'm new here, so I, I came into an organization that I feel very fortunate, having worked in a bunch of different cities, a bunch of different organizations, I uh, feel really fortunate to have inherited an organization and a staff that really sees the value in transit. I think fundamentally, we are a city that's late to the game investing in transit. Uh, we talked a little bit about forward thrust that failed 50 years ago, and we had a vote for a monorail and then against a monorail and a vote for a light rail and then a monorail again. There's a lot of different votes in Seattle for transit. And so we've built Historically, our transit system, is the backbone has been the bus. And we're growing as a city. And we have, right now, 240,000 people that are commuting into downtown every day, about 75,000 cars, uh, so about a 30% uh, SOV uh, carpool mode share. And we're going to add 60,000 cars over the next 20 years, or 60,000 employees over the next 20 years, rather. And if you believe the local population, we can't add any more cars, uh, which I would agree. I mean, we're, we're pretty saturated in the peak period, so we have to do that through bus uh, in the short term and then sound transit in the longer term. And I think there's a recognition on our part that, that we need to make those investments in speed and reliability and that we're going to have to take some right of way uh, and dedicate it to buses so that we can uh, carry more people more efficiently. 
the story of how we got into the funding business is, I think, really a regional politics story. Every, uh, we had a ballot measure in March of 2014, so before I got here, that was countywide to increase the sales tax to pay for transit service. And it failed, it failed at the ballot, but what became really clear is Seattleites recognized the need to invest in transit, and so really quickly turned it around and uh, put it back on the ballot for a Seattle-only measure, and it passed with about 60% of the vote. And so I think that's where we got into it, was not uh, from funding. It was really, I would say, a sense of crisis, where we've grown by you know, 15 20% over the last decade, and our transit service was flat or declining. And so we needed to do something. And then I think from a, on the capital side, uh, sort of the same thing. We, if we're going to be putting that many more buses on the street, we need to make sure that they're operating efficiently. It leads to a lot of interesting tensions where, you know, what used to be paid for by the transit agency is now paid for by the city, and it's creating an a re, uh, interesting relationship where we're part customer, part collaborator, and I think that, that creates tensions for us, uh, but I think, I, would, I think the relationship side, I, I like to describe it as a marriage in which you can never get divorced, and so we fight, and, and but Hopefully and ultimately, I think we come back together at the end of the day and and try to keep working together productively. Yeah, I mean, part of the underlying tension too is, is Seattle's about a third of the population in King County, yet it's two thirds of the of the transit trips. So you you have uh, a need for that higher level of service, and it's not reflected in the taxing of the jurisdiction. But so when you're buying, basically, you're buying forty five million dollars worth of service from King County Metro. How does the city? know you're getting your money's worth, or how do you decide what $45 million worth of, of Metro King County service is? Yeah, so we, we use our transit plan, uh, our transit master plan, to guide where we make our service investments. And we've, uh, our transit plan essentially is focused on building a high frequency all day transit network so that you can really live uh, car free in the city and use transit as the backbone for how you get around. So we have a goal of having 50% of households within a 10 minute walk of frequent transit uh, by 2020 and I think we're a percent or two away and then getting up to a little over 70% by 2025. So uh, it's really about building, trying to build a frequent all day transit network. I think one is it's a recognition that People make a lot more trips than just work trips, and so having that all-day transit network is important. And I think the other reason it's important is that we, I mean, we're all here kind of work in the middle of, you know, we work in the, you know, standard nine to five jobs, eight to six for some of us, eight to seven for others. Uh, but there's a lot of people that work, you know, the night shift coming downtown to clean office buildings or, you know, work retail jobs that have different hours. And so providing frequent all-day transit is helping those folks get to work as well and increasing mobility, social mobility as well. So, uh, Peter, first, first of all, Peter, welcome to local and regional government. We, <laughs> many of us told you for years, it's where the fun is, it's where the real action is. So it's sure. great that you finally saw the light and you're, you're here with us. So. I for moving east uh, to Seattle. It's always nice to uh, have another East Coaster out here. Let's go Mets. So, uh, Peter, you, you, know, you, you deal region-wide here, uh, not just with the city of Seattle, which I said, you know, it's a minority of the population of the region. You have some very significant cities, um, Tacoma, Bellevue, Redmond. I mean, these are not only significant population, but pretty significant economic areas. And you've been engaged with them now in composing this package. Uh, can you describe a little bit how Sound Transit works with those jurisdictions, particularly when you're talking a lot about future growth patterns and trying to, to put your uh, you know, your alignments in places where it's gonna make sense and where the, the market's gonna respond and the zoning's gonna respond? Sure. Well, I think a um, couple of things. I'll just, I'm actually newer here than Scott, but I will still welcome you all to the region and, and do a quick digression to say, you know, you, there were those dinners that you all could sign up for. And if I can give you one piece of advice, 
try the local wine. There's a lot of high quality Washington State wine that never leaves the state because the Seattle restaurants scoop it all up. This is your shot. So <laughs> back to transportation. Uh, <laughs> um, there is, uh, you are correct. In fact, the Sound Transit District, just to give people a flavor, includes most of, but not all of, the three county areas. So most, but not all of uh, Snohomish County, the north, that, that includes Everett and the largest manufacturing facility in, in the world, but also the United States, the Boeing plant at Painfield. Um, it is also uh, includes most, but not all, of King County, which, if any of you know, express, expresses all the way out to Issaquah in the mountains, as well as cities like Redmond, Seattle, and Bellevue. And uh, most, but not all, of Pierce County, which includes not just Tacoma, but also important cities that we serve by commuter rail. We have, we are a, 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 many people don't know this, we are the largest commuter bus operator in the United States based on the National Transit Database, commuter bus being defined as uh, city to city bus service uh, with few intermittent stops. Um, and that is a reflection of what Scott spoke to, and that is that there's a very, very rich bus culture in this area dating back to the fact that they had the opportunity in the 70s to vote for rail and did not. And that resulted in a big expansion of the bus market. Um, we are, the, if you will, the fourth bus provider in the region because each of the three counties have their own bus provider. We are, if you will, the region-wide provider. Um, but we are also very aggressive in not only expanding our commuter rail service, both north that comes down from Everett every morning and, and, and south up from Tacoma, but uh, expanding light rail throughout the region. Uh, and that is really about the proposition of the fact that the region is going to have 800,000 additional people by 2040, uh, just as the nation will have about 70 million additional people by 2040. But and this is one of the things I was, you know, studied and worked with Secretary Fox on I think this is not news to many of the cities in the room, but of those 70 million additional people that are coming to the United States, really unlike any population boom that the country has seen before, it's predicted that they will overwhelmingly locate it in just 11 major metropolitan areas, in which LA is certainly one, we are another. So big, you know, so what, I, what I've been telling people is when you're talking about adding 800,000 people just to the Puget Sound region, that is the equivalent of taking the entire population of Seattle and almost the entire population of Tacoma and leveling it on top of the populations and density and congestion we have today. Uh, that is why we are busily about the business of trying to expand our light rail network, um, which is sort of, if you will, the centerpiece, but not the only piece of our, 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 our ballot measure, uh, because increasingly, our bus throughput times, our ability to support all of this by bus, especially given the fact that we have some of the worst performing HOV lanes in the country uh, in terms of the time benefit of being in an HOV lane, um, is really why we you know, need to effectively catch up, to use Scott's reference, to, to build out rail. So as a term, getting back to your question on liaising with cities, it's absolutely critical. We have 52 separate cities in the Sound Transit taxing district. Uh, and there's one aspect about our relationship with cities that really hasn't been discussed yet, especially when you're talking about capital expansion, is I need permits from all of them if I'm going to build anything within their confines. And that is an important part of the relationship. Uh, we are lucky in that, you know, you talked about cross-governance and Mayor Garcetti just happening to be the board chair. Well, right now, you know, my board is 18 elected officials, but it automatically, by statute, includes the three county executives. It includes representatives from the three largest cities. So Mayor Murray, Scott's boss, is also on my board. Um, and as is the King County Executive is our board chair, he oversees King County Metro, the bus operator who actually we contract with to operate our buses and even our rail vehicles. So there's an extraordinary amount of cross-fertilization and. Um, incestuous relationships here that can work uh, for good or ill. And normally, I mean, I think our challenge, Scott's, mine's, uh, Rob Gannon at King County Metro, their, current, their counterparts, is to make sure that we're kind of constantly trying to work the relationship toward a productive end for all of our services. And there are certainly conflicts. Um, 
just to give you a flavor for one that just sort of speaks to the constraints we have with this many more people. I don't know how many of you have seen it or whether there's been a tour of it or such, but um, just a couple of blocks from here, uh, there is the only joint bus rail tunnel in the United States that operates. We, the King County Metro buses go through it. Some, some sound transit buses go through it in order to avoid the street grid on Seattle, as do my light rail trains. Uh, but that's not sustainable uh, because of the throughputs that we need on light rail. Friday, we're going to have a very, very challenging day where we will have a spike up of ridership that always happens on Friday here, uh, especially folks going to our new stations at Capitol Hill and Husky Stadium, uh, which has caused our light rail ridership to spike 77% in one year. Um, so we'll Friday, we'll have the spike up of the normal Friday service. We'll have the Mariners, who at least are making a run at still being in the wild card, and they will have a game that will start at 7. And at the other end, at Husky Stadium, the Huskies will play Stanford at 6 p.m. all on Friday afternoon in the Friday afternoon rush. It's kind of, <laughs> it's rather spooky. Um, and we're going to be trying to push through rush hour buses and all of our trains through that one tunnel. So we need to work with cities to figure out, you know, how, to Scott's earlier point, how are we going to use the capacity we have smarter? to get all the throughput we need, how do we expand, and then I will need the partnership of all these, these cities. And yes, they are very clear with us in terms of what they want to see happen in their cities. So there's a sort of tension between what we think is you know, our planning departments and what we think is the wisest way to go versus the vision that each one of these cities has for their stop in their downtown all rich with the debate over what is the best TOD opportunity versus what is least disruptive to the built environment today. Um, and uh, it's a rich conversation. We, we work it out amicably. Um, I will say this, it, it, I, I, the best thing that I've got going for Sound Transit right now is the fact that I have all of these locally elected leaders that I need to work with, many of them also on my board. And if there's a mayor who's not on my board, I have the benefit of their county executive to help liaise with me to make it happen. And just you know, having looked at this from 180 miles south for a couple decades, that collaboration is relatively new here. I mean, about the time Seattle was turning down forward thrust, right. Portland was turning down the Mount Hood Freeway. And you know, so there was this divergence. And over the years, as Portland built light rail, we would look up here and say, well, yeah, they can have Major League Bay, they can have the port, they can have all this stuff, but they're never going to get their act together on transportation. And now that you have, you see the, the, res the results is that it, the difference is the leadership. And, you know, right. these quirks. You have all, we don't several have, of we you don't have, have an NBA team. Yeah, 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 yeah you lost <laughs> the NBA team. Moved to Oklahoma City. Well, wow. so you've, several of you have mentioned tension, and I think that's a really important point um, that how do, how do you surface these conflicts and resolve them? That it's not about reaching kind of a surface consensus where nothing's actually settled and people are pretending to get along. You want to talk about some, you know, contentious situation, rights of way where you've had to, I mean, I'm thinking of Wilshire Boulevard, not to pick on Beverly Hills because they're not here, but, you know, I know LA wanted to do, is doing things on Wilshire Boulevard in partnership with, with Metro, but then you have the intervening jurisdictions, whether it's Beverly Hills or, or whoever else. Part of Los Angeles, too. Yeah. Yeah. So describe how you uh, resolve conflict, you know, face, surface it, bring it out in the open, and, you know, you have to a certain degree winners and losers. Yeah, and uh, for those of you from the East Coast, just to give you a sense, and I think this is true in Seattle as much as it is in Los Angeles, there's not a culture of directness. There's not a, um, it's a, there's another way of saying that, which is that everybody is really nice, and um, they don't, you know, you don't get called out in front of, you know, your, your peers very often, and it's, um, and so it is, uh, that by itself is something that you have to sort of respect and figure out how do I show up in this room so that I'm still in the tent with everybody and they don't think that, you know, I'm, I'm you know, an outlier and they take me seriously, but that they hear me and that, 
I, I figure out a way to do that um, so that everybody else can feel comfortable um, being honest. And a lot of times, you know, we do it with humor or we, we do it with, uh, you know, or I know that I can, you know, have an ally, strong ally in Stephanie and we, our relationship is strong enough that I can say some direct things and she's going to say some direct things back and we're going to be friends afterwards and it's going to be fine because that's what you do. Um, in a professional environment, but um, we get into, I think, you know, you're talking about permits and, and getting actual, doing project delivery is where things get the most tense, I would say, because that's where the stakes are the highest. Um, and there is political pressure, um, strong political pressure to deliver on something like the Wilshire uh, Bus Rapid Transit. And it's a fantastic project, and it shaved, I don't know how many minutes, off of that route. It's one of the busiest bus lines in the country, um, let alone LA County. Uh, but when you go through a part of Los Angeles and Beverly Hills, that dedicated right-of-way disappears. And Metro had to figure out, how do we deliver a project um, and not let the perfect be the enemy of the good and get it out there and show proof of concept because sometimes you just gotta you just gotta fish or cut bait you just gotta get it out there um, and then tell the story about it and then come back and gently try and persuade um, in the culture of nice uh, people to to sort of um, uh, be real about things and I think that it it does you know, when the, it's, it is very satisfying to deliver those projects together, and that definitely makes it worth it. But in those moments where we are talking about, you know, well, City, you said you were going to turn these plans around in 20 business days, and here it's been 21 business days, and a lot of this starts happening. 31 business days. <laughs> 97 percent of the time, oh, it's in okay. 20 business days. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, we do. We drop the ball. We screw up. And we have to figure out a way to work it through because it does get political above both of our heads. And those 31 business days mean real money. Yeah. Um, because we do want to deliver those projects, but they are challenging because the other person that's in the room that's not on this stage is the contractor. Mm -hmm. um, and they are just as much a part of this relationship um, as, as, as either one of us. And um, that dynamic also becomes uh, really challenging um, at times because Metro is trying to do a design build model, uh, but the city needs Metro to be engaged. And so I think that's one thing that Phil has really reset is mm -hmm. that Metro is at the table holding the contractor accountable and that gives the city a little bit of cover. We don't feel so uh, at odds because we do feel like We've got now somebody who's right next to us, and we're and we're working together. Mm -hmm. If I could raise one uh, one additional player that I think is critically important, and you, know, you are correct, we do have we're very rich in the culture of nice here, and it's nice. mo most days it's nice, nice. right? Yeah. Nice. Um, I, I think importantly though, there is a player who we haven't talked about at the table that I think can be part of the solution here. Solution is a strong phrase, can be a, a positive force. So we've talked about the city, we've talked about the transit agency, and you've talked about the contractor. And the politicians. And the politicians, but I think that uh, importantly, there's also the riders and the voters. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have observed, or I'll just speak in, in, in for myself, I've only been here since January 3rd. But there are at times when you're dealing with cities about the urgency of getting a project in the ground, there is a discernible delta between the absolute determination of the residents to get that facility as soon as possible and indeed the electeds to get it as soon as possible versus the urgency that city staff have in terms of helping you get to that point. That's not to run, you know, deride city staff. They are often understaffed. Uh, they are also, we, we have cities that we are trying to introduce light rail to who have codes that were never written to accommodate light rail and are genuinely you know, challenged on how to figure out how, how to issue a permit under those, gu under those guidelines. But I think importantly, uh, I have a goal going forward that I've talked to my board about, uh, about if, you know, replicating actually something that has had some success, not a panacea, but some success at the federal level. And I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not one of these people who think, oh, Washington, D.C. has all the answers and let's do it all you know, over the country. But, uh, the permitting dashboard that OMB runs 
in terms of where you actually have transparency, to your point, about which agency is supposed to sign off on which document by which date by a pre-agreed upon schedule. We have in this region an extraordinarily rich blogging community of people who seemingly have nothing better to do with their time than to uh, look at how these projects are progressing literally on an hourly basis. Um, we joke that um, every third cocktail napkin in this region has an alternative transit alignment drawn on it. <laughs> um, and, and that's because there's a, lots of public engagement and lots of public involvement. If you bring those forces to bear on just being everyone's, you know, keeping everyone straight about if we said we were going to get shovels in the ground by 2019, are we on the path to do so? Uh, that I think can be a positive force and, and having a transparent schedule at the beginning about what our goals are, letting the public know that, pointing out that as we have that some, you know, one of the greatest frustrations with our ballot measure, we put out a draft plan in March and the biggest criticism we had of it was actually not the taxes but how long the projects took and that is a common theme when you're dealing to major rail builds obviously. We were able to speed them up somewhat into June. But what we've also said is with the cooperation of the communities and all the players, we could actually deliver a number of them even sooner. We would not commit to delivering them sooner because we can't commit the cooperation of other cities. But if they would commit and, you know, if we could kind of get in a joint partnership with some transparent dates that anyone could see on the web and see who's meeting it, I, I think bringing the voters, taxpayers, and the blogging community into the conversation could actually be a very positive force. Great. Thanks. Uh, Scott, you want to add and then, then we're going to have to wrap up. Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is, this is fundamentally where, you know, the, the opportunity and the tension are going to lie between Seattle and, and Sound Transit over the next two decades, I guess. Uh, which is, so I think that the, this, we're going to go through this planning and alternatives analysis and uh, looking at different alignments. And this region has a history of having long and prolonged and pronounced fights over alignment that can take years to resolve, which, you know, we're going to have a new tunnel through downtown Seattle in November, hopefully. Uh, and that's going to be, I don't know, I can't we're remember. We're going to have it in November. It's going to be voted on. Voted on in November. We'll find out. Yeah. So it's going to be like five, six, seven billion dollars. I can't remember the, the cost of it. So every year that we fight and debate and push for our preferred alignment costs us hundreds of millions of dollars. And so we're actually working together with uh, King County Metro, Sound Transit, Seattle DOT, and the Downtown Seattle Association are also all working on a plan, all putting money into it uh, to lay out what the future of downtown is going to look like. And a big, big part of that is going to be Sound Transit. And so hopefully by kind of getting that jump in, getting, getting a head start on that, making some decisions quickly, hopefully we can avoid those you know, years of debate. And then what the city can do is we can stand up all of our departments. We're actually standing them all up right now, uh, the planning side, but also the permitting side to make sure that uh, once we all agree on what we're going to do, uh, Peter's team has a single point of contact that they can go to to get everything that they need from the city. Well, that's great. I think the lesson is not to not fight. It's how do you resolve the fights and how, how do you have the means to do that? And I think these folks show that one of the ways you do that is, you know, serving the public, that the people who pay Scott's salary overlap quite a bit with the people who pay Peter's salary. The same is here. And at the end of the day, they're here to serve the public. So before we thank them for, for all of their service, uh, you know, we're a philanthropic foundation, so we can't make any political statements. But if you do live in this region, you should uh, look at that Sound Transit 3. Man, that is, that's a really nice proposition. And if you live in Los Angeles, uh, there's this thing called Measure M. You know, you should really take a look at it because it's a pretty good value for the money. If you're not live in either of those places, but you do live in the United States, vote for the presidential candidate who sniffles least. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>